Mike McDaniel's regime is well on the way. We've got multiple interviews. There's moves being made. So let's get into it and start talking about it. Now, I'm going to kind of go over what's going on and give you my take. But before I do that, I just want to kind of say one thing to the uh, regular viewers. Sorry this is coming out a little bit late. Maybe I haven't been given as much uh, coverage as I'd like. Had some health scares this week a little bit. Don't think it's much, just kind of like a little bit of a workaholic. I haven't had a vacation more than like two or three days in a row in like four years. Got a lot of stuff on my plate. Kind of, this was like an unexpected thing with all my other stuff. So it's been basically a year in a row of this. So I just kind of got tired. I'm going to go on a business trip. Uh, put out this podcast, the Super Bowl podcast, and like two or three more. And then I'm going to take two and a half weeks off. So I just let you know I didn't drop dead or quit on or whatever. I'm just going to take a little break. But I am sorry. I want to give you better coverage uh, and really sorry about not being on top of this earlier. Going to really reset the way I do things in the second season to be uh, to deliver a better product to you, you know, because that's really my job. So anyway, I just want to let you know, guys know that. Again, sorry. So let's get into this. Now, McDaniel's been doing a lot of talking. And just like with Flores and every other coach, owner, and player, you have to understand, when they get asked certain pointed questions, they can't answer it with 100% honesty. You'd be stupid. They can't say, I'm taking the Fifth Amendment either. So what they do is they do coach speak. And there's nothing wrong with that, really. You know? Because what else are they going to say? What else are they going to do? Now, if they offer information that's when we can hold their feet to the fire as far as being honest and say, hey, you know what, you're being dishonest. But when certain questions are asked, they can't compromise the team or themselves. It'd be stupid. And so we have to have leeway. So for me, this whole new regime, it's going to be interesting to see the way certain fans and certain media types who were destroying Flores for doing coach speak and not just being totally blatantly honest about certain questions that were very difficult to answer. If they can do the same for McDaniel or was there really just prejudice with Flores and they got an agenda. So my evaluation is Ross, Greer, McDaniel, the team, but also the media going forward. So I want to make sure I pay attention to that. Now, what we all pretty much like about McDaniel is his Woody Allen-esque nature. He's witty. He's smart. He's emotional. um, He's genuine. And there's a lot to say about that. He's a likable guy, even though he's a little nervous Nelly and stuff. But again, it's like that Woody Allen type thing, which I think can work. Now, it might not work, but I think it can. But we have to be clear that what we like as somebody who we find personable or what we want to be friends with might not be the type of personality you want as a head coach. Throughout history, coaches or great generals, they had very strong weaknesses to their character, but they were very successful because what works on the battlefield or in a a pseudo-militaristic occupation like football might not work in the public sphere And what works in the public sphere might not work in the battleground. We have to see. You know, there's there's definitely, and every kind of personality can work. But there's strengths and weaknesses to each of them. And depending on the situation, it gets exposed, these weaknesses. So we'll have to wait and see. My one concern is, what he spoke of is, hey, you know, our job is to, to build the dreams of these players till they reach success. And if they do, they're going to believe in you. And this is totally true. This is why any personality can work. But, 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 authenticity is what he said. You could be authentically wrong. And you might not ever get to the point where you can really show how you can reach how you can get these players to reach their dreams. For an example, if he comes out and has some success, then they run into a hard patch, say, next year or the year after. 
all that success prior can help players say, hey, you know what? He did it here. But if they come out cold, they come out with problems, kind of like what Flores did in all three of his seasons, is this personality going to be the type of personality that can dig you out of that ditch? And the ditch is going to come. Every team hits that ditch. Now, if you've got credibility and you've got relationships and you've got success, that can help foster you to get out of the ditch without having a certain personality type, that hard-nosed, um, tough guy, strong, imposing figure personality. But if you're basing your success on authenticity and, and relatability and all this other stuff, but you're not having success early, then it might get to be a problem. But we have to wait and see. We have to wait and see. But that is the one concern I kind of have. Now, his first question was a, was a dozy, and that's why I opened up with the, you know, you can't always answer things truthfully. He was asked, did you have any red flags? Do you have any red flags with coming to the Miami Dolphins with Ross? He said, no, no. What else is he going to say? But if we're going to hold him to the same level of judgment as we did with Flores, then either he's a liar or he's an idiot. Because there are very serious questions here. Uh, Flores' team says they have evidence. And even if there's 5% chance or 10% chance that, that Flores and his accusations are true, you could be running into a new owner. You could be running into lost draft picks. There has to be a dozen red flags. Doesn't mean those red flags will pan out. So for him to say that he didn't, he, if, if you're going by how you treated Flores, either he's a liar or he's dumb. Reality is, I'm sure there were red flags, but he valued the situation over those red flags, and he's not going to tell you that. So he was doing coach speak here, which is not a knock on him. But again, these media types and fans who are killing Flores with the Watson thing and the Tewitt thing, they should be killing McDaniel right here. But it will be interesting to see. Now, he said it's not about a player or whatever. It's about the team. Now, this is the one area that I'm a little concerned with, a kind of little inconsistency. His first big media presence was the whole thing on the phone, on the plane with the camera guy, talking to Tua, and he's like, I see greatness in you, and I'm going to bring it out. And Tua going, I don't want any other coach but you. You're the coach I most want in the world. This was a media creation. Garfinkel and the Dolphins decided to present this. This was totally created doesn't mean that the sentiments aren't there. I'm sure Tua is very excited, you know, but is he the, the coach? He doesn't want any other coach but him. The guys never call the play. How could you be the only, the best coach that you want? You, it's a Sean Payton. You don't want him. You don't want Andy Reid, Sean McVay. You don't want any of these guys who've been doing it and shown, but none of them, but you want McDaniel. This is hyperbole. This isn't genuineness. It's a media creation. And the same thing with him. There's greatness here. This was all done to foster a certain segment who loved Tua and think that Tua was done wrong, which he was. But this wasn't genuine. And it's meant to reach these Tua fans to get them to feel good to support Ross and Greer and the Dolphins because they are on the siege in the media and public eye. Didn't like it, thought it was fake. Again, the sentiments might be there, but they're trying to snow you here. Now, if it's all about the team, then why is Tua being the focus? You know, I understand he's the quarterback, but if it's about the team and he keeps talking about, this is the player he's talked about most. And I think he, he said something else um, in an interview uh, here, and he talks about... Um, from what, I, from what I heard, his work ethic is outstanding, Tua, on the Joe Rosen show. Players have scars and need people to believe in them. That's the only business I'm in. This is a little overdone and emotional. Scars. Joe Montana, who did everything possible for the San Francisco 49ers, had Steve Young brought in while he was there and trying to replace him. Scars. I mean, yeah, Tua was done wrong. He had a terrible framework, but so did Ryan Tannehill. Maybe not the same degree, but most of the scars just seems like emotionally driven drivel to me. Tua did get done wrong in some ways. He's got responsibilities, some places he doesn't. But 
Tua was done most wrong when he was put in when he wasn't ready physically and didn't know the playbook. And Gailey wasn't in on that. Flores wasn't in on that. The staff wasn't in on that. And I will show in a podcast through all the videos and evidence that somebody above Flores made that decision, did it in a rush job, and ultimately screwed him out of Gailey, who was an excellent OC. So he had to have the three OCs in year two. Put him in when he wasn't ready. Then he lost Marshall, who was a good offensive line coach. And he lost Fitzpatrick. So whoever gave plenty of these scars to him is still there, which would be Greer and Ross. So this is like meant to like create the image that Flores is now gone. He didn't want you. He hurt you. But I'm here and I believe and we're going to heal you from what was done. This is BS. Total. And I don't expect McDaniel to understand this. But I will present it in full video how clearly Ross and Greer forced him in and totally screwed him more than anybody. But they're still here. So this was BS though. Um, but it's okay. These two guys are probably coming together, saying what they got to say to come together and make it happen. But know that the, this is BS. Now, a question is, why uh, are you ready? Now, his first response was, when I got here, I walked through the holes, I felt comfortable, and then he switched to something else, and then he began talking about this, that, and the other thing, and his experience. But it goes to show you, he started telling you what he felt, then stopped mid-thought, and then went into a, a more um, media-friendly, image-friendly take on it. Not to say he wasn't being true, but this guy understands what he's supposed to present. And so for me, he yeah, I can understand him feeling comfortable. And he mentioned Ross being a great owner, which he is. Ross is a great owner in the sense that he will spend, he builds awesome, he brings a great product as far as, you know, training facilities and this and that. Ross would be one of the best owners in the league if he would just pay the money, go all out to win, and stay silent. Unfortunately, it's proven true that he gets involved he gets in there and screws things up. So I understand when he walks through here and he's being told, you know, we want you, we love you, da, 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 and he sees all the stuff, how he could feel that way. But he went then, he decided, that's not what I want to present. I want to present something else. So I'm not really taking it anywhere, but understand, he understands what he's supposed to say and he adjusts as he's thinking. Now, he talked about being prepared. And I think that this is critical. And he talked about being nervous. And some people wanted to say, well, the fact that he's nervous shows that he's not a good coach. But if you go back and you look at Brian Flores when he first came in here, that guy was a wreck. You look at Brian Flores' final interviews and his first interviews, he was shaking in his boots. And I understand that. So to me that he said he was nervous, he didn't really even see. I think he, like I said, he's Woody allen S type persona. And that quirkiness is part of his nature. I don't really think he was that nervous. He looked like he was going to cry at one point. He was very emotional. Whatever. I don't care. Remember Dick Vermeil? That cried all the time. He was a good coach. So whatever. But again, again, let's not overparse things. But remember that just because the guy says one little thing, it's not the end of the world. We're still, you know, if he's nervous like Queasy was on film, Philbin in game day, it's a different story. But we got to let that play out. Now, the one concrete thing we got, he said he's calling plays. And he went into talking about how he calls plays and the style he runs. I thought it was really good. I wanted to show a video of Shane Gailey when he spoke when he first got here because Shane Gailey was the guy really helping Shanahan develop his system that could pass down all the way to the Shan son Shanahan and then to McDaniel. And Shane Gailey did a much better job of presenting what it's going to look like. And I think by showing this, it will get you more excited about McDaniel, but also help you understand how good Gailey was. I was going to put it in here, but I'm fried, burnt, got it on file. I'm going to do that again the next time. And he also mentioned being in the booth is not much different than being on a head coach down on the sideline. This, I think, is true, but wrong. And Gailey also had a very big, very good and illuminating take on that, a video. So I'm going to put those two together 
uh, later on in the week when I get some more energy and more time. But they're going to help you really, I think, get more excited about McDaniel's possibilities, but also help you understand that maybe it's not going to be as easy as McDaniel says it is. You know, but this is not to knock the guy. And not, I said there's, you know, there's going to be a period where he's got to grow through this, and we have to be patient. Now, he talked about, you know, your staff. You're only as good as your staff. And again, this goes back to it's an absolute truth. Absolute truth. The staff is the foundation. But if this is so true, again, Gailey being forced out was a crippling thing to Flores. And you go, why are you talking about Flores? He's gone. Well, because the same players that put him in that situation are now here with McDaniel. So if you like McDaniel and you want to know the truth and you care about what happened, then you need to understand the ramifications of what really went down and not just some drivel that gets put out in the media at times. So, yes, what he's doing now with his staff, his staff will make or break him. And then you have to add talent and production on the field and, you know, decisions and all that other stuff. But the staff itself is the foundation, okay? So I'm in total agreement with most of the stuff that he said so far at this point. Love this philosophy on the run game. This is something I've been talking about since I first started doing this channel, how I felt like the run game was starting to make its comeback. Not to be like it was in you know, the 80s and the 90s and early 2000s, but the run game played a critical role. I talked about how it played a critical role as far as the defense and the team for the Dolphins last year. He kind of confirmed all this stuff. So the people who were saying, oh, well, it doesn't matter. You know, the defense sucks. Well, then... At this point, McDaniel's an idiot because he doesn't know what he's talking about because he's confirmed what I said and the reality of the situation. But this goes back again to the Shanahan system with Gailey, who is a very, very run-centric coach. So there's a lot of good stuff here and a lot of things that can help us understand the past, the present, and the future. And the run game part was very, very exciting. But I'll say it to you this way offensive line makes the NFL world go around. I don't care about what his philosophies are, even his play calls. If you don't have an offensive line, you cannot run the football. So this leads into my next part that a little bit like, ugh. he said, Greer, uh, Greer was like my avatar. Was it? He was like my perfect avatar. He was the best GM I could possibly whatever, blah, blah, blah. If you go back and study Greer's history, which I'm going to do, the main thing he struggles at is offensive line. He's terrible, 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 terrible. I'll get into the whole framework of it, what it means to be the head of college scouting, how these players are drafted. Not that I'm a super expert, but I have some knowledge, and I don't think most people understand. But Chris Greer is terrible at the offensive line. Terrible, 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 terrible. So this was another, like, fluff statement. And he said uh, he had no ego and no agenda. Again... This is deflecting what's being said with Flores. But again, I ask you, who put Tua in? Who made that decision without consulting Gailey? It wasn't Flores. I'm going to do a whole thing on that, and it will be very clear, and it will show you that it was either Greer making the decision or Ross telling Greer to make the decision. Either way, there was ego, there was agenda. This is a lie. But he might not know all of that. I doubt he does. And he's saying what he thinks, but this is not a truth. Now, he said establishing dream is critical. He even said like, you know, because I'm not like a big guy and not a tough guy, you know, it's really all about building the dream and being authentic. I totally agree with this. Totally, totally agree with this. All they want to do, there's all kinds of types of coaches with personality types that are successful. He can be very, very successful with his personality, but, with every personality, there's a strength and a weakness, okay? So he could be authentic, but if he's authentically wrong, they're going to not care. They might like you, but they don't want you to be their coach. So for me, with this kind of personality, he needs to establish success early. So when the hard times come, and they happen to every team, every coach gets them. Sometimes early, like Flores, it's brutal. Some coaches, they have success, and look at McVeigh. They lost a Super Bowl and they had all these problems and they fell into the ditch. Eventually, you got to dig out of that. And for his personality type, if he can build some success early on, then he can go back to it. But my fear is if they come out of the gate cold, they have like a Brian Flores start, they struggle, 
this little personality who's saying, believe in me because I can bring you success, I'm authentic, they're going to say, well, I'm not seeing it on the field because that's what it's all about. So it's going to be very critical, for, in my mind, for his personality type to have success, to build on, to use that as a remembrance of when, when things get hard, hey, look, I got you out of here, I got you here. Where Flores, the hard personality type, the imposing figure, you can almost will yourself more to get people in line than this kind of personality type. But if you have high success early, this personality type can work, be very, very effective and ultimately might be more effective than the Brian Flores personality type, but we'll see. Now, the last thing I hated, because Safa Dean, I don't really like him as a journalist, if you go back to when Tua was getting drafted, there was a report of him feeling weird when he met with the Dolphins and da 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 And it was all based off one reporter, a young one-year journalist, Safed Dean, who had one unknown source, unnamed source, and a billion articles and a billion conjectures and stories came out of after that. And, I, and he was with the Dolphins one more year and then he disappeared to go to USA Today. He comes up and he talks about ethnicity. And if you all know, quote unquote, uh, the whole article is saying, oh, you know, oh yeah, they're going to hire another white guy in McDaniel and his father's uh, black and there's all this stupid, stupid stuff. And they asked him about race and he says, I'm just human. For me, it's very personal on many, for many, many reasons from the time I was born until now. I'm not going to get into all that. But my wife is Afro-Caribbean. My, my children, they have European descent from me, a little bit of European descent from her. They have some uh, native Indian descent from her, from Panama is where she's from, and also African descent. I believe in the human race. I love and hate people equally. I'm an equal opportunity racist. I like good people. I've seen, I have an odd life where I've been in many, many communities from the time I was born up until now. And I've seen wicked and evil and stupid and good and nice and caring and normal and okay people in every group. And you have to really parse that all together. But to me, I believe in one race. And I always tell my children, I say, look, some people are gonna hate you because your father or your mother. They're gonna hate you because of what they think you are look-wise because of this. And they're also gonna like you because of this and that. But I always tell them that people who are like that, who you are is gonna be like a Geiger counter. It's going to be an early warning system device because people are gonna immediately look at you and when they find out what your background is, they're gonna expose themselves, they're prejudiced. And anybody who has prejudice, even especially if they like you because of the way you look or what religion you're from or whatever, stay away from them. Because prejudice will always come back to haunt you because it's a lie. It's based on a lie. It's not based on who the person is. It's based on the surface stuff that has no value. And so I hated the fact that Safa Dean, who I really don't like as a journalist, had to bring this statement up and this guy had to talk about it. But he handled it great. He said, I'm a human. I identify as a human. My father says, whatever. Let's move past this. It's stupid. So stupid and annoying. So I'm, I, hopefully we don't have to hear any more about this but I love the way he handled it. Now, from a coaching standpoint, Josh Boyer is going to stay. This is great news because this is going to get you to be close, having a defense close to what Brian Flores could do. We'll also get to see, because a lot of people would say that Josh Boyer wasn't making the calls, that Brian Flores decided to make him halfway through, or, or, or Josh Boyer is a smart guy and Brian Flores isn't. We're going to find all that stuff out, but I know that this is a good sign. They're also bringing Wes Welker, Good to have him back. A lot of acclaim as a receiver uh, coach. That's good news. Austin Clark is staying. Now, these are good things. On the downside, Rob Leonard, who I liked as a linebacker coach, I liked how he went about business. He didn't have great players to work with. He didn't have great tools to work with, but I liked him. He's going to the Ravens. And the big surprise was defensive back coach Gerald Alexander, who basically many people uh, say he's a brilliant uh, football mind. You could see what he did with these defensive back. He wasn't retained, and that's a little weird. Don't know why. But we're going to see what happens. There's going to be more coaches coming in. It's really still too early. 
Uh, but this is where we're at right now. A lot of new stuff's going to happen over the next couple of days, weeks, and months. It's going to be a long evaluation phase. I'm kind of still in the same way as when I talked about McDaniel. I see some potential. I got some concerns. And I'm going to wait and see. So anyway, it's not the end of the world. Uh, a lot of stuff's got to play out. Who knows what's going down? Can't really make any judgments other than that he knows how to kind of play the game. There's a little bit of concern as far as him saying one thing, kind of going in another direction and willing to create the media image. But then there's that it, the intelligence, the underline of what's going on. And it was his early stage where he's getting bombarded with all this new stuff, pressure from the ownership, media questions. And so we just got to kind of take it with a grain of salt. So this is Curtis saying, thank you for staying to the end. Please like, comment, subscribe. Comments mean the most. Really love the comments. Going to be a little slow on comments, but forgive me. Again, I'm trying to restore the old body. Uh, subscribe and like help us with the Google overlords. Google overlords are powerful, keeps us in business and makes our sponsors happy. So please do that. <sighs> New regime. Let's hope this is the right one, Fin fans. This is Curtis saying thank you. Staying to the end. Catch you next time and be well. Bookies can earn hundreds to thousands of dollars from booking action with aceperhead.com.